hey folks, VC time. Yo, we still got a, we still got a, um, fucked up teeth, but I'm gonna talk to you. And it's time to get back to the music because um, when people send me stuff, you know, I respond. I really appreciate that folks send me music. Um, this one is going to be primarily about a, 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 a DVD that was sent to me. Um, it's, it's a review, but it's also a talk. So any of you folks that may watch this who don't usually watch me, um, just understand that, you know, I'm not sponsored. I'm not paid. I do this because I want to. And so I mix it up. I'm going to talk about Canterbury Tales, but I'm also going to talk about me because, um, that's why I'm here. You know, uh, recently on Facebook in uh, one of the music groups uh, associated with the Canterbury sound, Soft Machine and Gong, I had joined that group a while, a few months ago, but wasn't really participating. Started participating more and then noticed uh, names that I recognized. Um, and one of the names that I recognized was David Newhouse from the band The Muffins. I also have this one by them on vinyl. Muffins were the, the American equivalent to the Canterbury sound in my mind. I mean, just naturally, even though it was being talked about in the press, but I heard the music. And I've been into this music since I discovered it as a teenager back at the end of the 60s, 69, 70. And... Um, The history or a story of attempting to tell the story of the Canterbury Sound just came out on video <clears throat> called Romantic Warriors. Apparently this is a company that's that's doing a series on progressive rock music in DVD and trying to like put together a history. So this is the third one called Romantic Warriors 3 Canterbury Tales. I'm very pleased that Dave sent me his extra copy that's why it's like this he just um printed um the cover so i could make a, a box for it but um he sent me the dv the dvd romantic warriors three canterbury tales i've uh, already watched this all the way through and then i've watched most of it twice and it's a good job, you know. I think that the, the, the whole story of trying to tell the entire story of Canterbury-related music and artists would, would, would be a series, in my opinion. I think they did a great job, actually. And I think they nailed it. I just need to pull one more record here. In identifying the sources of this music. I like how the video starts off, I'll call it a video, DVD, I may call it, end up calling it a video because of my age, okay, but I like the way the video starts with Pie Hastings from the band Caravan explaining that Canterbury as a term for music was made up by the press. Um, it was the area where um, the band members were from, but uh, <clears throat> You know, the, the press have to have things to lay a hook on, and so that's what they did. But there was never any um, conscious effort for these bands to be Canterbury. And interesting to to hear different musicians say, well, we found out we were Canterbury through the press. We, we weren't thinking that. We're just playing music. Um, I want to try to say several things in this video so I hope I get most of them done. My introduction to the Canterbury sound was while I was in high school and coming from, I come from a family um, of dignified people but we don't have any money and so as a result growing up in school I knew how to read before, I knew how to read in kindergarten okay because of my parents okay. So consequently, by the time I got to fourth and fifth grade, I was above average. Well, I was about average in the white schools. When we moved, in, when we moved to the black neighborhood in fifth grade, 
all of a sudden we were all straight-A students, okay? Big difference in the uh, system. Um, these disparities are real. Remember, I'm trying to say a lot. Anyway, as a result of being a straight-A student, I ended up getting a scholarship to the local all-boys prep school, Creighton Prep, which is obviously for rich white people, or rich people back then it was definitely for rich white people. And when I went there, uh, started there in 1969, there was a total of 11 students in the entire school. You know what I'm saying? And we all stuck together. But anyway, I discovered Canterbury through discovering the band Soft Machine about that time. I can almost remember the actual day after school going down to the Metro Drugstore that had a record section. And they had... Um, you know, Columbia Records would put out those low-priced uh, compilations, uh, and this one, when it came out, it was only like a dollar, which is what I could afford. So I bought different strokes. It was a limited time offer, um, introduction to a bunch of bands at the time, and I already knew about the band Dreams. I had that album. It was one of my favorite albums of the time. And of course I'd heard all these other things, you know, Tom Rush, Beautiful Day, Miles Davis. But I had not heard Soft Machine. I had seen the cover. Okay, as a kid, I pulled some records because I want to try to put this together. As a, as a young teen, I definitely noticed this album cover, The Soft Machine, because of the woman's butt. Okay, and then... On the front cover, depending on when, where the wheel is, you can see her um, butt on the cover too. So, I had I had noticed this right away in the record stores. Okay, so I was curious what they were like. So when I got this, the standout, absolute standout track on this entire compilation is "Out Bloody Rages" by Soft Machine. And the thing that I noticed right away, which I want to throw in here because I think it's relevant, is that. As a child, my parents made sure to, in, they were musicians, my parents were both musicians and music lovers, and they made sure to um, expose all of us kids to all kinds of music already. So I was already familiar with Stravinsky and Webern and um, Terry Riley and Steve Reich. So when I heard the introduction on here, it's an edit, but the edited, edited introduction to Out Bloody Rages by Soft Machine on this, I immediately recognized they were doing a Terry Riley, which caught my attention, really impressed me, kind of blew my mind, okay? So I was hooked, okay? So that's my, that's was my introduction to um, the Canterbury sound, and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, I'll say more about me later. I think it's relevant. But to get back to this um, um, history, which is what it is, um, and it focuses, you know, the big story is about Soft Machine and Gong. You know, recently I did a, a video where I um, do my video tribute to David Allen of Gong and originally Soft Machine. He started Soft Machine and they tell the story, you know, that he was the one who had the vision that made it become Soft Machine. Um, this music, I love the story because it tells the story about David being, you know, a, you know, kind of bumming around and looked for a room, ended up at the Wyatt's house had these cool records, pretty much all this music from around the world, especially jazz, black American jazz, and how it opened up a whole world for these guys, and, and so that's what they start to do, is to try to play mu this music, you know, and I feel the connection, you know, I've always felt the connection where, um, it's hard to say, I'll, I'll come back to that, but I've always felt this connection, okay, people-wise, um, It's sort of an aside. The Beatles were very important to me in introducing me to the music of the continent, England, and Europe. And I was just I was just crazy about the sound of England. And even though England was enamored with R and B and the blues, I want to continue to point out 
that it wasn't the white people playing the blues that I liked, it was when the white folks would just be English. That's what appealed to me. It's like, well, I understand that, you know, you think it's cool to try to imitate this sound that seems foreign or exotic to you, which is what I grew up with. I grew up with literally in the company of those great musicians that they were all enamored with, you know, John Coltrane, Miles Davis, um, Cannonball Adderley, these people were in my house. I grew up around these people. My parents were musicians. And blues, too, you know. I was uh, surrounded with it, you know. So I understand the appeal of that music, and it's all in my DNA. But I also recognize this sound of these young kids over in England creating their own thing based out of these roots. I took to it, I just, I recognized it and loved it right away. I also want to say this, because it's pointed out in the video how the Canterbury sound, you know, as a, and like groups like that and like, say, like Genesis, as opposed to people like The Who, in the England, they were very, they're very class oriented, you know, and so Who is working class, Genesis and Canterbury is more upper middle class. And see, as a kid, I wasn't really thinking about that. I just knew I recognized um, what I liked. I also recognized early on that even though we were financially poor, my family has a lot of dignity. I recognized it myself. And that I recognized good things, things of quality. And also because my parents were musicians, this is all important to explain why this music is so important to me. And uh, I'll talk more about the DVD as I go. But I recognized, you know, quality and high musicianship, okay? Because my dad and mom were musicians. I recognized good musicianship and recognized that right away in the music of Soft Machine as well as Genesis. And um, so hearing in the... Um, in this story here where David Allen kind of opened things up with his record collection and then he tells you all the records that he had which I have all those artists have almost always had all those artists and those types of music in my collection you know I've, I've always recognized the Canterbury people as my peers yeah these are my like my peers you know what I'm saying from day one so to get back to an actual re uh, review of the DVD, I highly recommend this because this is a story of groundbreaking music that really changed a lot of things and yet the recognition is long overdue and most of these people never made a cent, you know, which I relate to and thought about a lot coming up how the best music doesn't make money and what a sad situation and yet that didn't scare me away because I always wanted the best. I still want the best, you know. But they, I mean, everyone from Caravan, Egg, Gilgamesh, Gong, Hatfield in the North, Matching Mole, they even get into um, bands. That's why it's so cool because they include bands like Moving Gelatin Plates and the Muffins. Uh, it's great. There's a nice segment in there where uh, they interview, uh, where Dave Newhouse plays and they interview him I am so stoked to um, to be knowing you now even though we haven't met in person Dave but to actually be connected and talking as friends to have you send this to me one of the members of one of the bands the Muffins of this for me one of the most important what you could call movements in music in my life, Canterbury is one of the most important music groupings of music for me personally. It is one of the most important in my collection. Uh, I was also very pleased to hear and not surprised at all, David Allen of Gong um, is a central figure in this story throughout and it's I was happy to hear him say that he was inspired by Peter Gabriel to dress up in Gong. It just makes sense, and I sort of sensed it all along. I somehow sensed that there was a connection between Genesis and 
the Canterbury group, even though they don't sound anything musically alike, they just always, since my teen years of discovering this music, it all fit together. It fits together. And so when David Allen name-checked Peter Gabriel, it was like, I knew it. I knew it. The story kind of jumps around, um, and Soft Machine's um, trajectory is kind of like, in a way, the focal point that they keep coming back to throughout the, the video, which makes sense. The Wildflower, Soft Machine, and Caravan were the first bands to come out of this movement. Um, thank you so much, Dave. Thank you. This means so much to me, and these are the sort of things that I live for. It's like, unfortunately, one of my friends in the VC, I won't say his name, is having hard times and literally is having to sell part of his collection. And he's got some very collectible things, so he's making money. It breaks my heart because I do not want to do that. It'll be a sad day in my life when I have to sell my records just to live. It may, it, the day may be coming. I, I'm trying to put it off. So what's the, what am I saying about this? It's just that these records and this music, still owning them at this point in my life just still means so much. This music has sustained me as much as anything else throughout my life. The sound of this music and what it, how it has colored my inner world. I can't say enough about it. So do I recommend people going out and buying Romantic Warriors 3 Canterbury Tales? Absolutely, please. I also vibe with Bill McCormick, <clears throat> who was in the band Matching Mole, as well as Quiet Sun on bass. I have all those records. I didn't pull them. I pulled a few. His first comment is, you know, somebody made money. Where is it? <clears throat> Why didn't I get it? Why didn't we get it? And I so feel him. I feel his sentiment because it's part of the madness of record collecting in that their records are very collectible now, but they get no royalties, you know. And a lot of these records are really worth money now, you know, but they, they don't get a cent. And the fact that many of them hardly made any money when they were making them. Like when David Allen told me that for the three records he made for Virgin Records, the, the trilogy, and he never made a cent, he ain't lying. It's the truth. It's sad, you know. And these people, this music has raised the bar. The musicianship of the Canterbury School of Musicians raised the bar permanently. In such a good way. So I just pulled to just kind of... Because I found the first Caravan album when I was still in high school. And... Here's my name. I put my name on it right away. This, from the very first listen of this album, Place of My Own, it was magical. It was what I needed. I needed a space of my own mentally to survive. Being kind of a dorky kid, when I, especially when I got to North Omaha and we, we lived and moved from a mixed neighborhood to a primarily black neighborhood, we were scorned. They thought that the Higginses were fucking it up for everybody because here we come, uh, with our Uncle Tom asses getting straight A's and making everybody else lose, look stupid. That was the actual uh, vibe in the neighborhood. Our house would get egged. I'd get beat up and shit. This music saved my life. You know, it's what I'm saying. It's the other reason why I keep saying very pointedly about the reality of life, you know, which is, you know, I've consistently, while having this channel for five years, have people who don't know shit about me come up and say, oh, well, why don't you show more black music? Aren't you into hip hop? Don't you like rap? I'm a human being, you know? I'm not a stereotype, I'm a, I'm a whole person. I like life. And so therefore my receptors are open to whatever. And this music hit me like a fucking ton of bricks when I first heard it. This is my music. I get, yeah. You feel that anger? I get sick of that shit, fucking stereotypes. To this fucking day I'm dealing with it, okay? This is my music. Okay, these are my bros, as well as Public Enemy, and Bootsy and James Brown, and, and 
John and Alice Coltrane and Miles Davis, who've actually been in my home. And Rasan Roland Kirk, who scared the shit out of me visiting my dad. People like that, these are, they're all my brothers. It's my family. I love this music. Caravan in the Land of Grand Pink. Had this copy since high school, all taped up, played to death. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Caravan, if I could do it all over, I could do it all over you. I always picked up on that slightly naughty sexual con uh, jokiness about the Canterbury school with their titles and stuff. A lot of puns, a lot of little jokes. Because I'm not English, I didn't always get a lot of them, but I figured many of them out because of just being so interested in the uh, culture. Waterloo Lily. I have, I think I have hundreds of records related to Canterbury. I just pulled a few. This music is really important to me, you know. Soft Machine Third. When I this is my original copy I bought in high school. Beat to hell. Took it everywhere with me. Under my arm. Just like when you see dudes walking around with a Miles Davis album or a Sunrise album, you know, representing. You know. I got beat up for doing this, you know, but this music meant that much to me. And here's my a UK copy. You know, this is fantastic music. You know, I'm only missing a few Soft Machine albums. Um, it's second, that's an original, Volume 2. This band is really important to me. And Dave, I can't thank you enough. Musicians of Canterbury, the, the school, which also includes the rock and opposition. I made the connection right away when I heard Henry Cow. Even before Robert Wyatt performed with him, I heard it. Henry Cowell, all that. It's all related. Some of the very best music to be made. It's, to me, unfortunate that none of the Canterbury School of Musicians will probably ever be inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which, to my mind, is just, you know, unconscionable. It's really unfortunate that such great art, such, in my opinion, high art, healthy music, completely ignored by the industry, which to me again says a lot about where the industry is at and has always been, which is not good, exploitative, and about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and dragging people down and destroying them. Whereas this music, the Canterbury School of Music has helped me. It's helped me mentally, physically, and spiritually, along with other musics and other forms of art and reading and stuff. It's helped me to stay alive and to forge a, life, a philosophy of life that works for me. And yeah, I can't say enough good. Dave, thank you again for being so kind to send me the, the, the DVD. I'll look online to see where to link folks who want to buy this. I can't say enough good. I also received another record from another record label, L'Amour, which I'll do in a separate video. Um, I'll show it. They sent me the new Igor album. It comes out in May. I'm very impressed with it, but I'll do a separate video on that. The music in the background I'm playing is uh, from an, a compilation album called Island of Sanity, New Music from New York. And I put this on because some of these folks on here are friends of David's. Uh, I know he knows uh, folks in the band Fish and Roses. He probably knows a lot of folks on here. So. I've received a couple of more um, pre-orders for Myths and Realities. Folks, thanks for, ha for having faith in me and hanging in there with me. I hope to hear some good news shortly about the records. Um, every now and then I get a... Um, I'm playing Cheese of Rainbow by Rolling Stones here. I get a little trickle of, of um, orders on my records. And I need them, folks. I need them. I, I, I um... <sighs> yeah, I'm just... We'll end on this. Romantic Warriors 3. Canterbury Tells. This is really quite good. I highly recommend it. Thank you again, David. Thank you.